This episode of Two and a Half Geeks is brought to you by Data Robotics Drobo. You may be familiar with Drobo for the home user, but for small to medium-sized companies, check out drobo.com slash business for simple, sophisticated storage solutions for the enterprise. Coming up on Two and a Half Geeks, we're talking with a Z68 chipset from Intel, an HTPC called the ASRock, and a whole lot more. The bar has been set wicked fast. It rocked in the benchmarks. We're going to up the ante uh, a little bit. Processing power. Maybe. I kind of understand this. Welcome to Two and a Half Geeks. I'm Aya Zachter alongside two boneheads from hothardware.com. You know, Dave Altavilla and Marco Cipetta. How are you guys doing? Did I'm you hear what he right called us? Before the bonehead comment. <laughs> <laughs> nah, you guys know I love you, but I can't say that stuff on air. I'll, I'll be slapped with the harassment suit again. Let's just talk about technology instead, shall we? Good sure. idea. All right, no more feelings. It's too mushy. Let's talk about Intel launching the Z68 chipset for Sandy Bridge. Marco, you guys changed the lineup just before we went on air, which means I have no idea what we're talking about. Why don't you explain this to me? Sure, although this was in the old lineup too, so you didn't do your homework. <laughs> but what the, uh, the Z68... <laughs> Um, is basically Zing. the latest chipset for Intel's Sandy Bridge platform. And it's, it's sort of a combination of the P67 and the H67. When uh, Sandy Bridge first hit, uh, users were kind of forced to choose between the P67, which had all the enthusiast features like CPU overclocking and what have you, but no support for QuickSync, or the H67, which supported Intel's integrated graphics um, and gave users access to QuickSync. Now, with the Z67, you sort of have the best features of both chipsets kind of mushed into one with the addition of a really cool feature called Intel Smart Response Technology, which is a new uh, SSD caching technology that will boost system performance. Now, is this the same chipset that was actually in the IMAX like a week earlier before their official launch? And if that's the case, how is it performing? You know, I'm not sure if this is what's in the new IMAX. I haven't followed uh, that storyline. I wouldn't be surprised if it was because it's uh, technically the same piece of silicon as the P67 or H67. So it's likely that that is what Apple is using. Um, but performance is good. If you, if you discount the smart response technology and you just measure system performance versus the P67 or H67, it, it's right on par. There's no real changes you know, at the chip level. But if you factor in the smart, smart response technology, you can get you know, up to a 40% boost in system performance and sometimes a 3, 4, 5, or 6x boost in HD transfer speeds. So what kind of clock speed are we talking about? How many cores are on these, these Sandy Bridge stuff? Is it the same 6 and, and 4 core stuff, or is there 8 core? What's going on? So, well, the chipset, there are no cores in the chipset, but as far as the processors the Z68 supports, it's, it's all uh, LGA1155 Sandy Bridge-based processors, which on the desktop consists of an array of dual and quad cores. Um, in the mobile space, there's also dual and quad cores, and uh, eight-core chips will be coming down the line, but probably will use a different socket. No word on those just yet. Now, speaking of mobile, let's talk about even smaller mobile computing. How about the Samsung Infuse 4G? I know, Dave, I think you just happen to ha have one there. Uh, I do. What do you want to tell us about that? Actually, it looks like a large phone. What, a 4.3-inch <laughs> yes. AMOLED? Yes, it, yeah, 4 and a half inch and uh, it is a beauty. Um, four and a half inch, uh, really large screen, uh, thin, okay, you know, about 9 millimeters thick on its edge. Um, Eight megapixel camera on the back with flash, yeah, but the the real feature of this phone is Samsung's uh, Super AMOLED Plus display that is absolutely gorgeous. One of the nicest displays we've ever seen in a phone, and I'm sure this webcam shot is not doing it justice. But uh, really nice phone. Um, Samsung's Hummingbird 1.2 gigahertz Hummingbird processor under the hood, so a little bit of goose in clock speed. Uh, one gig was the initial Hummingbird clock speed. Um, so yeah, really nice, uh, good multimedia capability with uh, Samsung's um, graphics core. The is it a power uh, power VR core under the hood, Marco, in, in, in the uh, Hummingbird chip? I think so. I, I believe it's a derivative, but I'm not certain. Yeah, something of that ilk. And so yeah, good multimedia processor and a really big screen that is just gorgeous. Now it's a Samsung phone, so it's probably got Android. I assume it's not one of those Indeed. Windows Phone Seven ones, is it? No, no, it's absolutely Android 2.2. Good question. And Samsung does a really nice job, if you can take a look here, of skinning uh, Android 2.2 Froyo with, you know, their sort of light skin, you know, sort of uh, theme, if you will, that just really nice bright colors, uh, big icons, good contrast, and um, 
you know, not a lot of bloatware, a little bit on there, of course. You get customizable home screens that you can um, set up. You just pinch and you can take a look. There's a number of home screens there. And so, you know, a really nice, really nice phone for the money. I want to say it's $299 on contract. Uh, excuse me, $199 on contract. And, um, you know, we, we really liked it a lot. We're, we're going to put it through the benchmark paces in the uh, days ahead here and have a full review coming to you uh, soon. Apart from the screen and the uh, Samsung skinning, is there anything that really sets this thing apart from all the other Android phones? Uh, oh, it's 4G. Did we mention that? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe the title. Yes, Infuse 4G. Does it actually use <laughs> HSPA Plus or is it LTE? It, it, it's actually it's AT&T's 4G network, so it's not LTE. Oh. Um, what? It's an aw. Aw. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, we, we have to do some testing with AT&T's 4G network out here in the Boston area. We have been taking Verizon's LTE network for a ride on a couple of phones like the, the uh, Thunderbolt. Um, and, boy, does that network kick some serious butt. I mean, the download speeds are like, you know, cable modem class kind of performance. Um, we'll see what AT&T can put out here in Boston. Um, but we haven't been impressed so far with what we've seen from AT&T's 4G. But, hey, it's, it's still faster than 3G, and hopefully AT&T will get to work on that network performance. You know, I don't know if I want to go out and go test a phone like you're going to do. I probably want to sit on my butt and watch TV. You know what would be a good idea for that? An HTPC. Maybe an ASRock HTPC with uh, NVIDIA 3D Vision Tech. Marco, do you know anything about anything like that? I do. I, I know a lot about it because I have been reviewing. Well, I finished the review, but this thing was in house for weeks on end while I was setting up a, a, a proper home theater. And I got intimately familiar with it with the machine. The, the full name is actually the ASRock Vision 3D with NVIDIA 3D TV Play technology. Um, Awesome, awesome little home theater PC. Uh, ASRock used all mobile components in the machine. So you have a mobile CPU, mobile GPU, uses so dims, nice small form factor, mobile hard drive, uh, slim slot load Blu-ray player. It kind of looks like you know a, a beefed up Mac Mini if, if I was to compare it to uh, some sort of white box machine, but just perfectly suited for the home theater. Literally took this thing out of the box, plugged in the HDMI cable, plugged in the network cable, plugged in power, Five minutes of Wizards later just to set up to 3D on my Samsung TV, and I was up and running. And I got to say, the experience um, was nearly perfect throughout. Really, a really nice home theater PC. Now, you're saying it's kind of like a Mac Mini. Now, how is it on power consumption? And they didn't mm. do anything crazy like try to make it difficult to disassemble, did they? No, actually, <laughs> the complete opposite. Power consumption was, uh, was phenomenal. It peaked at under 70 watts. So that's you know nearly double what say uh, an AMD Brazos based home theater PC pulled, but we're still talking very low power consumption. That there's a, one fan in the system to dissipate that heat, and you can barely hear it when it spins up. Uh, it's really quiet, and disassembling the machine is super easy. There's actually a button right in the back. You just push one button, and the top panel pops right off. There are a few more screws underneath to to gain access to the components inside. But you're talking, you know, a two-minute disassembly process, easy to upgrade, you know, if you wanted to. And just, you know, just a really solid job. The, the machine, it really couldn't have been easier to use. Now, if you were to compare it to, say, a media streamer where, you know, you just plug it in and, you know, access your network shares and play stuff, it's a little more complex than that because it is a Windows environment. But the advantage of the Windows environment for a home theater PC is you can basically play any kind of file you want. And if the machine's not ready to play it, there's codecs out there where you can just install and then play it. So I, I was really, really impressed with the machine. I, I liked it a whole bunch. Now, it's got some kind of NVIDIA 3D tech. How did, that, how did that actually play out? Did you enjoy the 3D stuff? Could it actually handle the, uh, the amount of processing involved for 3D uh, picture? Yeah, it has uh, plenty of horsepower. You're talking an Intel Core i3 processor and NVIDIA a GT425 a GPU in there. And uh, it was... It was a completely painless experience so that the 3d setup was literally just a matter of running a wizard on the tv you know and making sure you you, you select the proper image for each eye it took like two minutes and then the 3d playback of blu-rays was handled by power dvd or nvidia includes their own player for standalone video files and 3d photos and uh, I found, actually, the playback to be better than a set-top box. I also have a Samsung 3D Blu-ray player, which is perfectly fine. 
but the image quality was simply better from the GPU and the home theater PC. There's just you know more processing going on, uh, more cleaning up, more cleaning up of the images, and all around just a better 3D experience. With that said, it's still you know 3D on a TV. So if you don't like you know the slight dimming of color, and if it gives you a headache, if you're one of the people that gets a headache from the uh, the active shutter glasses, you still have to contend with that. But it's probably one of the better 3D experiences I've had. Now, Dave, you, so you really you found this to be actually literally better than a, a, a standalone Blu-ray player? Yeah, absolutely. You know, unless you're springing wow. for a super high-end plus, it's got you know, doing all the additional post-processing to clean up the images perfectly. Um, a, a powerful home theater PC with a good GPU is going to be better in most cases. You know, I, that's I, impressive. I'm yeah. getting the itch to get rid of my PC and get a get a new HT PC. But a new study is saying that apparently people have this itch to replace PCs every four years. Dave, could you tell us about the study? So yeah, we have uh, an article up. St studies show that users experience a four-year itch. And uh, this was a study that was taken and, and put out by uh, Crucial.com, the memory company, as you may know them, uh, manufacturers of uh, all kinds of computer memory. And uh, they did a poll of users, and you know, 47% of the users that responded said they were dissatisfied with their computer in some way. The, the chief complaint was that it was slow, and uh, let's see what else we can tell you. Uh, they also said that 50% of the users will replace their computer within that four-year time span. Um, and so it seems to us that, you know, that's you know, almost, you know, a needless sort of thing. Uh, and, and the folks at Crucial would argue that if they only upgraded their memory, um, they would perhaps be more satisfied with their computing experience and not have that itch every four years. No, wait, this is a study from Crucial, the guys who sell RAM, and they're yeah. suggesting that you buy more RAM instead of, I guess, replacing your PC. I mean, it is actually cheaper to upgrade your RAM. It's one of the first things you should do if you have an older PC. Uh, would you actually, do you agree with, with, their, with their findings? Or do you think that just simple upgrades like that would be enough? Or do you think within four years that it really is time to just junk your machine and start over? Uh, I, I think unless you are a, a real power user, um, Junk in your machine every four years probably isn't necessary. You probably can upgrade some components and get some additional life out of it. Uh, let's face it, the average processor these days, especially when you're talking about dual cores and quad cores and six cores, I mean, um, you know, th there's a ton of horsepower under the hood. Uh, and I would argue that, you know, uh, agreed, the folks at Crucial, would, you know, for real old machines, for older machines from previous generation architectures where, you know, two gig perhaps was the standard install of RAM. I mean, they talk about a Dell Dimension machine that had 128 meg of RAM. I don't think you can buy, you know, in the last, you know, four years, you probably haven't bought any machine that had that little bit of memory installed. But, you know, where we're coming from a generation of maybe two gig installations to now where the average installation, especially with, um, you know, Intel Sandy Bridge processors and AMD quad core processors that are coming with four meg plus installed, or excuse me, four gig plus installed on the machine, um, you know, I think a memory upgrades, you're going to probably reach, you know, diminishing returns at a certain level, certainly at the four gig and up level. Um, a hard drive upgrade, and, and the folks at Crucial might want to retarget that study and look at SSDs. A hard drive upgrade, on the other hand, could really improve your experience. Um, and the average notebook coming out with a 5400 RPM hard drive, um, you know, definitely could see a performance boost to a 7200 RPM notebook hard drive or of course an SSD, an SSD if you can you know fork up the money for that and certainly a bit more of an expensive position same thing at the desktop uh, you know the average hard drive that gets full of user data upgrading to a larger capacity drive that you know has better aerial density uh, and better you know general performance overall than in the initial drive in your machine will enhance your experience probably significantly more than a you know uh, something over the four gig mark in memory upgrade. Let's talk about contests, giveaways, invites. Who wants to cover this this week's hint or actual information? Marco? I, th I think I think I'll do it this week. Okay. So unfortunately, we're still not quite ready to announce a, a hardware giveaway. 
Yeah, we always have the wheels turning. One is definitely coming. We promise. We have never let you down in the past, so stay tuned for that. Um, but we're, we're in full swing uh, with the AMD Fusion uh, Developer Summit giveaway. As we mentioned in the last podcast, AMD gave us 25 free passes to the event. Uh, normally, it would be $300 to register for one of these all-access passes. And uh, at, the, at the AMD Fusion Developer Summit, uh, users are going to have unfettered access to all of the top minds at AMD, software developers that are there uh, talking about the apps that will be built to expose the APUs that uh, AMD is building. Plus, there's going to be tons of hints at next-gen technology. It's going to be a very cool show, and we're going to have 25 of our favorite hot hardware readers there with us. So uh, come by the site. Uh, the post is going to be live before this goes live, hopefully, and you'll see uh, how quick and easy it'll be to get your hands on one of those tickets. You said your favorite. If you look at some of the agenda items as well, there's lots of hands-on breakout uh, demos, so should be some yep. really cool tech demos for folks to come see as well. So wait, how, how are you picking who gets invited? Or do they have to be your favorite people? Do they have to send you things? <laughs> No, we're, it's actually, we're just going to, because the event is up in, uh, in Bellevue, Washington, uh, we know it's going to be tough for, you know, say some of our uh, Canadian or East Coast readers to get there. Um, it's just the tickets that are up for grabs, not travel to the event. So um, if anybody's going to be in the area, simply shoot us a note. And once we've compiled the list of everybody that wants to go, we'll select 25 from that list and they're going to show up. So write hopefully. nice things, people, and be nearby because yes. they're not going <laughs> to hang with us too. Yeah, I guess that could, that's a plus or a negative. It's kind of hard to Poor tell. Poor people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Don't forget, you can find everything we talked about over at hotharbor.com. It's a nice site. You know, they got lots of information. They could explain things to even somebody as silly as me. Uh, so that's it's good stuff over there. Definitely worth checking out. Or you can go around the web, by the way. If you want to do that social thing, you go to facebook.com slash hothardware. Or you can go to twitter.com slash hothardware if you want that really small headline kind of thing. Maybe you want a video. YouTube.com slash hothardwarevids. Or if you're still on Dig and you're with that last guy, dig.com slash hothardware. <laughs> I think that does it for our fine little show. We'll see everybody next week. Thanks for stopping by.